Hey, how are you? Thanks for following this. Um, today's story, I'm going to talk about um, David Bowie's manager, who was my manager actually too. He had a company called Main Man and Tony DeFreeze, who we used to call the Deep Freeze, um, managed me for about six months. Uh, let's see, how do I start? My friend Sandy Dillon was um, a really good friend of mine, a piano player. I kind of called her like the Janis Joplin. She was really cool at uh, singing. She had a very unique voice, wrote these really great tracks. And she called me up one day and said, hey Manny, um, I'm going to audition for Electra Records. And I think she mentioned D David Bowie's manager, but I'd love for you to be in the studio and work the mixing board while I'm out in the recording part of the room playing piano, singing for the president of Electra Records. And I said, sure, absolutely. I think we did it at the Hit Factory on 53rd, 52nd, 54th Street. And um, we went in and uh, Tony DeFries was there. I didn't know who he was. I knew of him because he was Bowie's manager, but I didn't know directly, you know, by sight who he was. Um, Hi, how are you? So on, great, great. And we did a little test run through. The engineer set up some microphones. We set some levels, some reverb, dimmed the lights in the control room and just had a spotlight on Sandy in studio. And um, Bob Krasnow, the president of Electro Records came in and his son, Mitchell Krasnow. And uh, hi, Tony, uh, hi, so-and-so, that's Sandy in there. And this is Man Parrish. And he goes, Man Parish. And I went, uh, yeah, hi, how are you? And he goes, uh, you have that record out, Hip Hop Bebop, that's doing well. I said, yeah, 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 doing great, doing great. So Sandy starts playing piano, and uh, the lights were off in the control room, and Bob now says, Tony, can I speak to you outside? Well, I didn't know what was going on. I thought, oops, okay, that's kind of rude. And uh, came back in and uh, Bob Krasnow sat down and started listening to Sandy. And Tony says, can I speak to you for a second outside? And I said, sure. You know, go home. I thought he was gonna tell me I did something terribly wrong. Uh, the lighting wasn't right or something like that. And he took me out in the hallway and stood right here next to me and the door to the, the studio is right here. He leaned against the wall and he said, look, do you want a record deal on Electra Records? And I was like, I had already finished my Import 12 deal. I was done with them. I walked away from them because I wasn't getting paid. And I was like, um, yeah. He says, I can get you a record deal and I can get you a really good deal. Um, so this is a yes. And I said, yes. He shakes my hand. He says, holding my hand, he goes, 50-50. We're partners, right? Now, legally, a manager can only take 15 or 20% not 50. I didn't know this. I was, you know, 24 years old at this point, 23, 24 years old. I said, you know, sure, we're partners. Goes back inside. I sit down, calls Bob Krause now out. I guess he said, you know, let's do the deal. Talk to you Monday kind of thing. And Bob sits back in with his son. They listen to Sandy and they loved it and they want to sign Sandy. But a, a, a couple of days later, I get a phone call. Tony wants to see you at his place. He lived right off of Central Park South on, a, on an apartment that looked, uh, on David Bowie's money, apartment that looked over Central Park and his bedroom looked all the way down Broadway to 42nd Street where they raised, where they dropped the ball. And I was like, wow, this is like rich. Uh, went up to the apartment and um, he had stacks of papers, I think two stacks of papers about that thick. And he said, well, if you want the deal, it's here. We got it. We expressed it. We got it all done. And all you have to do is sit down and sign. Here again, I go. I don't have a lawyer. And I said, well, I don't have a lawyer. I got screwed before. He goes, oh, that's small time. This is big time. This is a big contract. It's got all these protections in there. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the contract technically was a real contract, but I signed a management deal with him, which is one of those stacks of papers which gave him total control of the money and spending it and what to do, so on and so on. Signed the papers and then he sits me down and he says, look, this electronic music is never going to go anywhere. It's just a waste of time. It's a short fad. I want you to get a rock and roll band together. 
I want you to go for singing lessons, and you're gonna have a guitarist, and you're gonna slide across the stage like David Bowie did with Mick Ronson, lick the guitar, and you're gonna be a rock star that we could put on the road and tour, because there weren't any touring synthesizer bands in those days. It was just a fad. And I'm thinking, oh God, well, this guy knows what he's doing. He did David Bowie, Mott the Hoople, New York Dolls, Dana Gillespie. Uh, I thought, okay, I'm going to listen to this guy. So he gets $125,000 for a single. That's usually album level stuff, but this is Bowie's manager. And this is his new star. And he's got Sandy Dillon and a friend of ours, Donna Destry. Um, his brother is Jimmy Destry in uh, uh, Blondie. She was also, she wasn't signed to Elektra, but Sandy and I were, and Sandy was a separate project he was working on. So um, my friend Michael Wodetsky, who passed away in Boyd George's apartment, that's a whole other story. Uh, um, I rented a remote recording uh, truck. My friend Steve Remote had a 24 track studio, uh, mixing board and uh, um, tape machine, portable studio in the back of his truck and he would go do remote location recording bands that played and so on and so on events. And we edged that into my father's driveway with barely enough room to, to slide by. I think there's a YouTube video. If I find it, I will put it down below. You could see me. I was so young, 23, 24 years old, Michael Wadetsky and Steve. And we decided to do a song like Michael Sambella who had maniac, maniac, uh, so we were going to do, uh, um, he's got the power, he's got the power, and it was this horrible, horrible, horrible song, because I was a fish out of water, I was trying to emulate what was on the um, radio right at the time to please the record company, instead of doing what I should have done, which is my old and sound that they signed me for, but I'm listening to Tony DeFries. And, um, we hand it in and the record company flips out. What is this? This is horrible. This is a piece of crap. The, ah, what is this? You know. In the meantime, Tony, somehow or another, I was getting um, statements every month. I was going through $30,000 a month. $30,000. I was living in a loft with no heat. They gave me $500 a month or $1,000 a month to pay my rent and a couple hundred bucks to for food, like three or four hundred dollars allowance. So I got about fifteen hundred dollars a month. I didn't buy any equipment. I didn't do anything. But these statements from Tony DeFries and Mainman were saying, limousine. I'm like, I'd call up and go, what limousine? Well, you know, Tony had to go from the airport and he flew first class from, to, from Switzerland and, you know, he can't pay for that. You're the artist. It's on your behalf. And then, you know, the limousine waited outside of blah, blah, blah record company while he spoke to the president. And that's at $100 an hour. You, you get where this is going to. And then they went to the 21 Club because they couldn't go to McDonald's, right? And I'm like, uh, uh, okay, I guess, you know, this all evens out and I start making money. So we went to $125,000 in four months. Not me. He did. And these statements were justifying all this expense. He was buying Cuban cigars and Fabergé eggs and all kinds of stuff. So um, the record company flipped out and Tony said, well, I'll tell you what, give us another $25,000. <laughs> we did this. Give us another $25,000 and we'll do another single. So uh, back comes the truck. I came in from Manhattan. I was living on 14th Street, 9th Avenue, right across from the Apple Store on the top floor of the loft building there. And I'd get on the subway, go to my parents' house in Brooklyn. It's the only place we could park a truck and throw, throw, throw a giant extension cord out the window. And I did this song called uh, Tarzan Man or something like that. And it was, I think if I, if I put that video link, you'll, you'll, you'll hear some of it. It was stupid stuff. And I was now totally confused. I didn't know what to do, who to please. And um, went back to Manhattan, got a phone call. My mother had passed away. She had Alzheimer's disease. That's a whole other story. And within two or three, well, let's see. Um, I got a phone call because the record company didn't like this Tarzan man thing. So uh, I get a phone call from Tony DeFries' secretary. She goes, Manny? And I said, yes. She goes, Tony's no longer going to represent you. And I said, what, what, what? She asked, She's, he's not going to represent you. I said, why? He goes, because the record label dropped you. And I was like, what, 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 what? And my mother was sick and dying. And uh, he said, well, that's it. You know, I said, well, 
can I have my money to live on? No, no, no. Uh, I said, put Tony on the phone, please. I want to talk to him. What? Went no, Tony doesn't want to talk to you. And I'm sorry. I'm, I'm the middle person. I got to hang up right now. And I went into shock. And two days later, we were playing at Studio 54, which is a story I'm going to tell you about because Madonna was my opening act. Two days later, my mother died, or a day before my mother died. We went to the. I went from the cemetery to Studio 54 to do that show, and. When I finished all that, three or four days later, I went into shock. And I, had, I was crying, I went into a deep depression, I had my bathrobe on, and I had a teddy bear, I'm embarrassed to say, at 23 years old. And I held the teddy bear and I just walked around the house crying, pacing back and forth. Friends would knock on the door trying to get up, call me. They broke the door down because they thought I was dead inside the door. I killed myself, I wasn't answering the phone. And I was sitting there on the floor in the middle of the loft of the teddy bear, just with tears coming down. I hadn't bathed and I looked really terrible. And um, my father called and said, why don't you come home? And I gave up my loft because I couldn't afford it anymore. It was only a $1,000 a month, but I didn't even have that. I had no job. Uh, and I moved back to Brooklyn. The tenant, we had a two-story house and the tenant upstairs moved out and the place was free. He says, just come home. You know, my mother died and at least the family could be together. And uh, that was a that was a real rough one. Um, I heard Tony. Uh, first of all, according to books and things, Tony had taken big advantage of Bowie, and supposedly Bowie didn't make money until way later on in his career because Tony spent it, and Bowie wised up and pulled away from him. But um, Tony's living, I think, in South Africa. But uh, somebody told me that he some online investors got to him and swindled him out of all of his money like a karmic thing you know what i mean so um you know uh that was that was a rough one and at that point i kind of had a breakdown from music i i didn't know what i was doing anymore i kind of got ripped off from my record company and then again with this whole david bowie's manager in a major label and i was the next big thing and all this money that disappeared and um uh i fell to pieces and that's a cheery ending. So uh, I just wanted to give you that story. It's kind of cool. Uh, thank you so much for listening, really. Uh, I, I really appreciate this. This is stuff that was going to be in a book, and I couldn't get the book out, so I'm doing it this way. I'm not editing any of this. This is just direct from, from my mouth. So if there's pauses or stutters, I don't look pretty. I don't care. I'm just, I want this to be real and direct as if it was live. Um, if you could subscribe, it really helps the channel, please. And please tell your friends, hey, check this out. Um, and that would help. Thank you again, and there'll be more stories in a day or two. Thanks.